Mm -hmm. it's working now. Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks, Shinjit. So uh, thank you again for joining us uh, today. Um, uh, as many of you know, this week, uh, February 6 to February 10, is the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Week, or what we call EDI Week, which is organized by the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Calgary. EDI Week includes events that cover topics related to indigenous peoples, women's rights, uh, racialized groups, uh, people with disabilities, and so on. Uh, every year during this week, our center organizes an event related to EDI issues. And as you know, this year, our event is going to talk about uh, building capacity, truth, and reconciliation, which is presented by a remarkable uh, speaker. Uh, I will let my colleague Pamela Dostramos introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Myrna. Certainly. Thank you, Myrna. So it is my honor and absolute pleasure to introduce Cheryl Shenyo gray -Eyes. Cheryl has been a friend and colleague of the Alberta Civil Liberties Research Center for many, many years. And I'm very pleased to call her a colleague and friend. So Cheryl is a proud Nehia Esquau, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Cheryl, Cree woman. She's a member of the Muskeg Lake Cree Nation in Saskatchewan Treaty 6 and Métis. Her ceremonial gifted Cree name translates to healing woman who walks far. And she has resided in Calgary, Treaty 7 region, Alberta, since 1993. Cheryl earned a BA in communication and a BA in Canadian in Native Studies from the University of Calgary and a Diploma in Advertising and Public Relations from Grant McEwen University, which is in Edmonton, as you know. Cheryl received the rank of Corporal in the Canadian Air Force, receiving an honorable discharge after five years of service. She has been an Indigenous activist within Calgary and area for the past two decades, speaking, marching, singing, and drumming for women. And I'm sure many of you have seen her doing this on TV when the news has been reporting on those events. So she's also been speaking, marching, singing um, for missing and murders indigenous women and girls and two spirited people, sisters in spirit and justice for Jan Jackie Crazy Bull, for indigenous justice, championing the environment and equality, and speaking up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Cheryl retired as administrative coordinator at the Native Center at the University of Calgary. She was the former leader of the Green Party of Alberta from 2018 to 2019, and a Kairos Blanket Exercise Facilitator, 2017 to 2020. Cheryl is recognized as a traditional knowledge keeper, a Cree elder, and a pipe carrier. She provides service sharing Indigenous protocol, territorial acknowledgements, medicine wheel teachings, Indigenous cultural teachings and stories, prayers and ceremonies, all upon request. She's a member of the Storytellers of Canada and Storytelling Alberta, as an Indigenous storyteller and performer. Cheryl is a mother of two and Kokum or grandmother to five beautiful and adorable grandchildren. Cheryl. Thank you so much, Pamela. I am truly humbled and honored. Um, as uh, Pamela mentioned, I am from Muskeg Lake Cree Nation in Saskatchewan, Treaty 6. I wish to acknowledge the fact that we here in Calgary are on the land of the Treaty 7 people. We are on the land of the Blackfoot from Siksika, Gainai, and Bigani. We are on the land of the Dene from Tutina. We are on the land of the Stony Nakoda people from Morley, Shiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nation. 
Here in Calgary, we are in Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. And Calgary is known as Mokinstis, which means elbow in Blackfoot. Today, I'm going to be very honored to share um, an introductory uh, little overview of the Medicine Wheel teachings, which is the foundation for the Building Capacity Truth and Reconciliation Project. Um, I would humbly ask those who are, are coming and joining us, um, if you could kindly mute your um, uh, uh, microphones, please. I'd be very grateful. Um, I'm hoping that I won't have any too, too many technical difficulties, but I will be sharing two PowerPoints, the first one on the medicine wheel and the second one on the building capacity truth and reconciliation um, uh, slides. So without further ado, I will share my screen and get started in a good way. What is the medicine wheel? I received levels one and two medicine wheel facilitator training from Kakakawain Associates, Regina, Alberta, Regina, Saskatchewan in 2007. What is a medicine wheel? Imagine a round pizza cut in half and then cut in half again, making four pieces of pizza, four quadrants. The medicine wheel is a teaching tool, a way to teach us how to live right and good lives to respect one another and our beautiful mother earth. The medicine wheel is a metaphor, a symbol, a way to remember. It helps provide purpose and understanding in our lives and how to live life in gratitude. The medicine wheel reminds us to keep ourselves in balance, healthy, whole, to live our lives in moderation with not too much or too little of anything that we indeed have enough. It shows us that it's all good that we are to accept and respect ourselves and others, and that we're perfect right now in this moment. There is no right or wrong way to view the medicine wheel. Indeed, you will be looking at two different interpretations, mine and Teresa Miles, who helped me with the, with the Truth and Reconciliation Project. Whatever makes it easier for you to remember these teachings as an individual, as a family, as a community, as a nation, Whatever works best for you is the right way. I am sharing what helps me to remember my view, my interpretation, and my learnings. The center of the circle right in the middle symbolizes the creator, the source, the starting point, the seed, the universe within each one of us. There is no circle without a starting point, much like the compass tool that we use to make circles in geometry and math. In the center of the circle is where true power resides. Love, principle, justice, spiritual knowledge, life, forgiveness, truth. Powers which reside in the very center of the human being. The circle represents all that is, ever was, and ever will be. All creation, the never-ending cycle of life and living. The circle is a measurement with no beginning and no end. If we sit in a circle, and listen to everyone's point of view, we get a more accurate knowing of what is. If we put our minds together, we get clarity from each other. We appreciate each other, honor and respect one another. The circle shows us that we are all connected, that everything is connected and interdependent. All my relations means that we are one with everything and everyone and that all things have a spirit. We honor and respect all, us two-leggeds, the people, the four-legged, the winged ones, the animals that live in the waters, the creepy crawlies, the standing people, or the plant nation, the grandfather rocks like our beautiful mountains, and our beautiful mother earth. There are some characteristics that are evident in the systems that Creator has made, the inside and the outside of the circle. Balance, harmony, polarity, the two sides of life. Every positive has a negative, every plus has a minus. There is black and white, 
life and death, right and wrong, past and future, up and down, and the daily choices between love and fear. Spiritual law is the same. It has light and dark. Both have purpose, so both need to be honored and respected. Some call this balance karma, and the key is to work to maintain and restore that balance. Lessons can be learned on both sides, and every problem has a solution. We learn far more from our mistakes than from the things that we do right. Each of the four directions has special powers or grandfathers that are here to help us. Starting on the right side of the circle, the east is where the sun rises and the day begins. At the bottom of the circle is the south, where we feel those warm breezes. Night comes with the setting of the sun on the west side or the left side of the circle. At the top of the circle, we can feel the north winds cold and blowing. We call upon these powers by standing in the center and facing each direction, honoring all life in each direction. We become centered, ready to call our helpers from the four winds and open our heart to creator. Winter is when nature sleeps. The cold winds come, the darkness settles in and the animals hibernate and rest. Spring mm. is a time of birth and growth the gradual warming and awakening of our mother earth. New beginnings, more light, longer days. Summer is a time of warmth and heat. Long sunny days, luscious growth and abundance. Fall is a time of harvest, fruition, gratitude, lengthening nights, a time of preparation. The creator designed all life to happen in a circle. The leaves bud, then mature, change color and fall off the tree to fall and return to Mother Earth. The birds struggle out of their shells, grow to adulthood, mate and bear their young, then migrate home. The salmon are born, swim to the ocean, live their lives, and then swim back to their spawning grounds, then die. We honor the cycle of all of our seasons. All aspects of the life cycle should be honored and respected for the gifts of each life stage. When we make decisions and choices, we must consider seven generations back. What will our parents, grandparents, great grandparents, and our ancestors think of the decisions that we're making today? We need to also consider seven generations ahead. How will these choices impact our children, grandchildren, great grandchildren? great-great-grandchildren those yet to be born. We must also consider the seven sacred teachings. Courage, honesty, humility, love, respect, truth, and wisdom. When we are born, we have obligations to the past, the present, and the future. We make better choices when we think like this. The eagle rises in the east and represents vision, clarity, truth, dreams, creativity, and justice. The wolf represents respect, family, cooperation, consideration, strength, and kindness. The buffalo will head into a winter storm, knowing it will get through the storm faster than by running away and hiding. The buffalo is steadfast, faithful, persevering, and strong like the mountains to the west. The bear is fearless, strong and courageous, dependable, wise, and patient. The bear is sensitive to appropriate timing, knowing when to fill up with pond berries and when to sleep and awake in the springtime. The medicine wheel teaches us how to balance our lives physically, emotionally, mentally and spiritually. Know that sometimes our body can play tricks on us, especially when we get too tired, when we get sick or if we eat too much. We really didn't need that second donut, did we? No. If we are out of control emotionally, we get fearful, angry, doubtful or upset, and we can overreact. We are out of balance. Our heart, while it means well, sometimes can be 
fooled or hurt or sucked in by others so that the heart can play tricks on us too. If I think bad thoughts of myself or others, I am out of balance mentally. Our brain is a good tool, but it can be loud and obnoxious, telling us that we aren't good enough, being very critical, making us afraid or hurt by the words and actions of others. Remember, we are the boss of our monkey brain and we can change how we think if we want. We can choose love over fear and change the way we think. Put your hand on your belly button. This is where spirit resides, where we were connected to our mother. That soft, quiet voice that warns us to be careful or tells us to connect with some. Our intuition gives us clues, tells us that we have that gut feeling that something might be wrong. Listen to your spirit. The medicine wheel represents the gifts of the sacred medicines, which are used in the smudging ceremony to clear our energy, reduce our anxiety, calm us down, and to help us pray for guidance. Sage is a women's medicine represented by the East as a woman provides the gift of life. The South represents cedar, the healing medicine. The men's medicine or child's medicine is sweetgrass, which is situated in the West in balance with the female energy of the East. Tobacco is considered sacred, traditionally honored by being placed in the North to represent closeness to creator. The four elements. The medicine wheel reminds us that we have everything we need to survive and thrive right here, right now, enough. We are to be grateful for the gift and the miracle of life each and every day. As a human species, we need fire to keep warm, cook our food, electricity to power our appliances, light the darkness and to conduct our ceremonies. The fire of life resides in each and every one of us. The earth is our mother, the soil of the standing people and provides sustenance and nourishment for all living beings. We need water to survive. Our bodies are over 80% water and we would die of thirst far sooner than die of hunger. We need to keep our water clean. We should drink at least two liters of water per day to maintain good health and body balance. The air that we breathe is our most vital element. We need clean air to live well. The smudging ceremony brings together all four elements. I use the burning container of an abalone shell, which represents water. The medicine or the plant that we are burning represents earth. When we light this smudge with wooden matches, that flame represents that element of fire. As the smoke rises, the spirit of the medicine, this represents air. There is also the balance of the male and female energy as the shell represents water, the female energy, and the spark of fire is the male energy. That is a quick overview of the medicine wheel teachings, which we are going to be referring to in the next PowerPoint. Let's try that again. Welcome to this Diversity Week presentation, courtesy of the Alberta Civil Liberties Research Center. I will provide a comprehensive overview of the Building Capacity for Truth and Reconciliation Project 
and the Indigenous focused anti racism workshops, consisting of a PowerPoint slide development developed and created on behalf of the Alberta Civil Liberties Resource Centre as a year long project. I wish to acknowledge and thank Teresa Miles, graduate student working in the Faculty of Education at the University of Alberta, whose hard work, diligence, an adaptation of her dissertation, which looked at the truth and reconciliation, calls to action through the lens of the medicine wheel teachings. And thanks also to Rowan Hickey, articling student and project research extraordinaire during her tenure with the Alberta Civil Liberties Resource Center. Special thanks to Linda McKay and Pamela Basramus for their ongoing support and encouragement in the development of this project. The agenda is as follows, introductions, history and legislation, education, health and welfare, children's services. As an introduction included in this workshop is many, but not all of the 96, 94 calls to action, which were part of the final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015, and how they apply to the history, focus, revelation, learnings, and calls for change and action from our governments, our educational institutions, our communities, our families, and indeed ourselves as individuals. As this is an overview rather than a complete and full presentation, I will be omitting slides such as health rates, survivors quotes, additional references, YouTube videos, and other documents and sources referred to in the full PowerPoint. This workshop incorporates the medicine wheel as its foundation of understanding these concepts, which was the purpose of introducing and reviewing the medicine wheel teachings at the start of this presentation. Each of the areas of discussion will be presented along with elements of the four directions, the four sacred medicines, the four spirit animals, and the four senses of self and how they apply to the area under discussion. The medicine wheel used here has been created specifically for this workshop by a First Nations treaty status individual and is representative of the concepts involved in this act of reconciliation. The circle represents the circle of life. The background colors represent the blue sky and the green earth, and that we are all connected in our daily living. Each quadrant will be reviewed in detail as we get to each section of the presentation. The East Quadrant is the first one highlighted, and so begins our educational journey together at this time. The East Quadrant is represented by yellow. It is a beginning phase of life and represents the history that became the foundations for legislation that regulated Indigenous peoples. The Eagle stands for spiritual protection, protection, as well as strength, courage, and wisdom. Sage is traditionally used to prepare people for ceremony and teaching, and used for cleansing and smudging, and it represents the cleansing of the mind and the heart to accept these teachings presented in this workshop. The physical aspect of being represents how history physically shaped the lives of Indigenous peoples in Canada. These regulations began with the Indian Act and continue through to today with recently implemented items such as the UN Nations, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. The first topics of discussion include history and legislation. We will be discussing the Indian Act, historic treaties, modern treaties, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Bill C-31 and Bill C-10, and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, also known as UNDRIP. The calls to action, number 42, includes a recognition and implementation of Aboriginal justice systems. This would include policing, the Gladue reports, restorative justice practices, among other topics. Calls to action 51 and 52 apply to legal processes and their relationships to treaty rights. Calls to action 53 and 54 ask for the government to establish commissions, release data, and produce reports that would advance the cause of reconciliation. 
calls to action 55 and 56 ask for all governments to provide annual reports on the progress towards reconciliation and the government's plans for advancing the cause of reconciliation. Call to action number 57 asks that the government provide training and education on topics such as residential schools and UNDRIP to public servants. The Indian Act of 1867. The Indian Act pertains to people with Indian status. It does not directly reference non-status Métis or Inuit peoples, as it was specifically created to legislate a group of people, the First Nations under colonial rule. The Bagel Report of 1844 was a commission led by Sir Charles Bagel. Recommendations were made to control Indian affairs and the education of Indian children. The Bagel Report is a clear plan of colonial control which was operating prior to Confederation in 1867. The British North American Act of 1867 made the federal government responsible for First Nations or Indians as they were called. Enfranchised Indians lost their status and became citizens like Euro-Canadians. They lost their indigenous rights, becoming non-status Indians. The Indian Act will be covered in more detail in coming slides. Under Section 2 of the Indian Act, Indian is defined as a person registered as an Indian or who is entitled to be registered as an Indian. Unless referring to the legal terminology of Indian as defined under the Act, Indian is no longer considered to be the appropriate way to refer to Indigenous peoples, First Nations, and is considered outdated and offensive. The Indian Act was amended in 1951, and then in 1985 it was amended again to align with the Canadian Constitution and Charter of Rights. The Indian Act imposed the elected chief and band council system. It denied women status, created reserves. It legalized enfranchisement the legal process for terminating a person's Indian status and conferring full Canadian citizenship. This allowed voluntary enfranchisement introduced in the Gradual Civilization Act of 1857, which assumed that Indigenous people would be willing to surrender their legal and ancestral identities for the privilege of gaining full Canadian citizenship and assimilating into Canadian society. Enforced enfranchisement for serving in the Canadian Armed Forces, for those who gained a university education, for those leaving reserves for long periods, and for Aboriginal women if they married non-Indian men, Indian men, or if their Indian husbands died or abandoned them. It denied Indigenous people the right to vote. It expropriated portions of reserves for public works. It renamed individuals with European names and it created a permit system. It prohibited sale of ammunition to Indians and prohibited sale of intoxicant to Indians as well. It declared potlatch and other ceremonial cultures, cultural ceremonies illegal. The Indian Act created residential schools, which ran from 1886 until 1996. It forbade Western Indians from public dance, show, exhibition, stampede, or pageant wearing traditional regalia. It leased uncultivated reserve lands to non-Indians. It forbade Indians from forming political organizations. And it prohibited anyone from soliciting funds for a legal counsel. The past system restricted Indigenous people from leaving their reserve without permission from an Indian agent. Please note this was not legislated, but rather a policy created in 1885 because of the real resistance and abandon in 1951. It was used to effectively control the movement of Indigenous people. Rations and other privileges could be revoked, and it was primarily used in the prairies. Parents required a pass 
to visit children in residential schools. You will see two examples of passes. The pass on the top was issued June 30th, 1892, to go to Prince Albert to run in a foot race, while the pass below it was issued on the 3rd of June, 1896, and gave leave for 20 days to visit children at the residential school in Regina. Historic treaties. The Royal Proclamation of 1763 formally established the treaty making process. Treaties of peace and neutrality covered military alliances and neutrality between French, English, and their indigenous allies. Peace and friendship treaties were signed between the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and the British. The Upper Canada Land Surrender and the Williams Treaties were land sessions, sessions negotiated by agents of the Indian Department and Indigenous communities, and were primarily one-time cash payouts with no or few ongoing obligations. The Robinson Treaties and Douglas Treaties promised the creation of reserves, annuity, and the continued right to hunt and fish on unoccupied lands. The treaties surrendered lands near the Hudson Bay posts. And in Victoria, in exchange for the continued right to hunt and fish, reserved lands, and a one-time payment. The numbered treaties were a series of 11 treaties negotiated to cover the prairies, northern Ontario, the Peace River and Mackenzie River valleys. They were influential in regards to the agriculture and settlement expansions across the Canadian prairies, construction of the transcontinental railway, and the affirmation of Canadian sovereignty throughout the Northwest Territories. Treaty rights were recognized and affirmed by Section 35 of the Constitution Act in 1882. Specific rights, benefits, and obligations vary from treaty to treaty. Land, which created reserves, provided annuities, $5 per year for every status person paid yearly. If treaty annuities were calculated to account for today's inflation and other changes, Author Jean Allard calculated the treaty payments would be over $275 per month per person. School and teachers on reserve were paid for by the federal government. Modern treaties. This era is considered to begin in 1973 following the Supreme Court of Canada decision of Calder versus Attorney General of British Columbia. Modern treaties cover Indigenous ownership, ownership over 600,000 kilometers of land, square kilometers of land, over 3.2 billion in capital transfers, prosecute protection of traditional ways of life, resource development, participation in land and resource management, land rights, and self-government rights and political recognition. In addition to the 26 treaties that have been signed since 1975, representing 97 Indigenous communities, the BC Treaty Commission is an independent body that advocates for and facilitates the recognition and protection of Indigenous rights and title through the negotiation of treaties and agreements, including the implementation of the UN Declaration. The Buffalo Treaty of 2014 is an agreement of cooperation, renewal, restoration, and it represents a significant step by Indigenous people to preserve prairie, prairie ecosystems and their culture. The Buffalo Treaty created an alliance among 10 groups aimed at engaging tribes and First Nations for continuing dialogue on bison conservation, uniting the political power of the tribes and First Nations of the Northern Great Plains, including in the United States, advancing an international call for the restoration of the Bible, of the story of bison, buffalo, engaging youth in the treaty process, and strengthening and renewing ancient cultural and spiritual relationships with the bison and with the grasslands 
and the Great Northern Plains. The Constitution Act, the Canadian Constitution and Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Under Section 35 of the 1982 Constitution Act, Canada recognized the existence of Aboriginal land treaty rights. Although Indigenous rights were recognized under Section 35 in 1982, Indigenous rights existed prior to the introduction of Section 35. Note that Indigenous right and treaty rights will vary from group to group, depending on customs, practices, and traditions. Indigenous women's rights. Under Section 35 of the, sorry, uh, Mary Two Acts Early was a pioneer an architect of the Canadian women's movement and helped to forge a coalition of allies to challenge Canadian laws that discriminated against Indigenous women. The work of two acts early culminated in Bill C-31, which received royal assent on the 28th of June, 1985. Bill C-31 amended the Indian Act to outline a process of reinstatement for some women who had lost their status because of section 12 1b. Sandra Lovelace Nicholas is the first woman of indigenous background appointed to the Senate from Atlantic Canada. She championed changes to the Indian Act that seek to restore the legal rights of many status Indian women and children. In Lovelace's international case, the UN ruled in her favor, stating that Canada was in breach of the international covenant on civil and political rights. While the UN lacks the power to change Canadian law, many Indigenous women saw this as a victory. Prior, there we go, sorry, Bill C-31. Indian status was removed from any woman who married a non-status man. If an Indigenous woman's husband died or abandoned her, she would lose her status. Indigenous women were subsequently expelled from their communities, having lost the right due to their loss of status to live on reserve. This expulsion severed them from their cultural communities and their Indigenous identities. Canada introduced an act to amend the Indian Act, 1985, Bill C-31 which removed sections 12. However, it also installed a new system of assigning status, a system which proved to continue the gender-based discrimination it had sought to remove. Bill, three, Bill, sorry, Bill C3 and Bill S3. After Bill C31, Indigenous women began to challenge the new registration provisions introduced. Sharon McIver brought a legal ace to the Brit legal case to the British Columbia Court of Appeal, where she argued that the status provisions under the Indian Act were discriminatory on the basis of sex and violated her charter of rights. The court ruled in McIver's favor and rules that provisions under the act violated the charter. The federal government introduced the Gender Equity in Indian Registration Act for Bill C-3, which received royal assent in 2010. After the case of Deschanel versus Canada, the Procureur General, where the Superior Court of Quebec ruled that provisions under the Indian Act violated equality provisions under Section 15 of the Charter, Bill S3 was introduced in 2017, an act to amend the Indian Act, eliminating all known sex-based inequities in the registration provisions of the Indian Act. United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, UNDRIP, September 13th, 2007. It was adopted by the UN General Assembly by 144 states. However, four votes against it included Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United States. Canada fully endorsed United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2016. On December 3rd, 2020, 
the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada introduced Bill C-15, an act respecting the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Bill C-15 delivers on the Government of Canada's commitment to introduce legislation to advance implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the UN Declarations, before the end of 2020. UNDRIP achieved royal assent on June 21st, 2021. Calls to action. Number 43 calls on all levels of government to fully adopt and implement UNDRIP. 44 calls on the Government of Canada to develop a national plan to achieve the goals of UNDRIP. 48 calls upon the church parties involved with residential schools to adopt and comply with the norms and standards of UNDRIP. Call to Action 50 calls on the federal government to fund the establishment of Indigenous law institutes. The Declaration is the most comprehensive international instrument on the rights of Indigenous peoples. It establishes a universal framework of minimum standards of survival, dignity, and well-being of Indigenous peoples of the world. The Medicine Wheel's second quadrant will be highlighted as we move clockwise on the Medicine Wheel to the south. This quadrant is represented by the color red and the next phase of, phase of life, which is youth. The wolf is a spirit keeper of the south, intelligent with strong instinct and demonstrates freedom as an essential way of living. The wolf can also have distrust and fear when threatened. This representation is strongly connected to education and the long-term effects of the residential schools of indigenous people. Cedar resides in this quadrant as the second of the four sacred medicines. Cedar is used for purification, traditionally used in ceremony for smudging, fasting, and sweat lodges. The emotional aspect of being is combined with the emotion and the trauma that follow survivors of residential schools to this day. We are learning about residential schools at this point in the presentation. Their learning stages of life occur at this time, which is why education is placed in this section of the medicine wheel. We will look at unmarked graves, educational success rates, and post-secondary education. Please be warned, there may be some trigger, triggering effects from the information that is going to be shared. The introduction to education will look at residential schools, unmarked graves, education rights, including graduation rates and post-secondary education. Calls to action specific to education start with call to action number seven, to eliminate the education gap between indigenous and non-Indigenous students. Number eight, eliminate the discrepancy in funding between Indigenous and non-Indigenous education. Number nine, prepare and publish annual reports comparing funding. Number 10, draft new Aboriginal education legislation. 11, provide adequate funding to end the backlog of First Nations students seeking funding. 12, develop culturally appropriate early childhood education programs. Call to Action 62 calls upon Canadians to develop appropriate curriculum and content to address First Nations students' needs from their kindergarten to 12. Number 63, to maintain an annual commitment to Aboriginal education. 64, Nominational schools to provide comparative religious studies that include Aboriginal beliefs and practices. And number 65, establish a national research project program with post-secondary edu um, educational institutions. When we talk about the residential school system, please remember Indigenous people who attended the schools in Canada's residential school system are not called former students or attendees or graduates. We call them survivors. 
For over a century, the central goals of Canada's Aboriginal policy were to eliminate Aboriginal governments, ignore Aboriginal rights, terminate the treaties, and through a process of assimilation, cause Aboriginal peoples to cease to exist as a distinct legal, social, cultural, religious, and racial entity in Canada. The establishment and operation of residential schools were a central element of this policy, which can be best described as gen uh, cultural genocide. This map shows the location of all 139 residential schools across Canada. What began as missionary schools progressed to being industrial schools and then boarding schools. Residential schools was adopted as the official term in 1923. Northern institutions also use the term hostile to describe residential schools. The goal of these schools were to kill the Indian and the child taken from their homes, stripped of their belongings and separated from their siblings. Residential school children lived in a world dominated by fear, loneliness, and the lack of affection. Residential school history timeline. 1834, the Mohawk Institute in Brantford, Ontario begins taking on borders. It is the oldest residential school included in the Indian Residential Schools Settlement Agreement. 1860, Beauval School opens in what is now Saskatchewan. 1863, St. Mary's School opens in Mission, BC. Also in 1863, St. Albert School opens in what is now Alberta. In 1867, the Constitution Act of 1867 assigns the federal government jurisdiction over Indians and lands reserved for Indians. In 1876, the Indian Act came into being. In 1879 was the Davin Report. 1894 was the amendment to the Indian Act which empowers agents to send children to residential schools and parents could become subject to pros prosecution. In 1903, three, St. Paul de Métis opens as a first residential school for Métis children. In 1905, it was destroyed by fire that kills one student. Davin is considered the architect, one of the architects of the Canadian Indian residential school system. In 1879, he wrote the report on industrial schools for Indians and half-breeds, otherwise, no, otherwise known as the Davin Report in which he advised the federal government to institute residential schools for indigenous children. Initially, the federal government covered all costs of operating the industrial schools. In 1891, however, this policy was abandoned in favor of one by which schools received a fixed amount per student, which intensified the level of competition between churches for students and encouraged principals to accept students who should have been barred from admission because they were either too young or too sick. The schools were indeed breeding grounds for disease, such as tuberculosis and influenza. Fear, anxiety, and depression brought on by dramatic change in lifestyle had an adverse effect on the immune systems. The children who could not survive in this harsh and terrifying environment died irate. In 1907, Indian Affairs Chief Officer, Medical Officer, Dr. Peter Bryce reported that 24% of students enrolled in 15 Western Canadian schools since 1886 were dead. Dr. Peter Bryce, a medical doctor, was hired by the Department of the Interior to manage public health issues in both the Immigration Department and Indian Affairs. Dr. Bryce's report was never published by the Department of Indian Affairs, quite likely due to its damning nature and recommendations for expensive renovations. In 1907, the national magazine Saturday Night reported on residential schools, observing that Indian boys and girls are dying like flies. 
Even war seldom sh shows a large percentage of fatalities as does the education system we have imposed on our Indian wards. In 1910, Indian affairs and church organization negotiate contracts, increase funding and impose standards. In 2014, Duncan Campbell Scott, superintendent of Indian affairs, acknowledged that the system was open to criticism. He said insufficient care was exercised in the admission of children to these schools. The well-known predisposition of Indians to tuberculosis resulted in a very large percentage of deaths among pupils. They were housed in buildings not carefully designed for school purposes, and these buildings became infected and dangerous to the inmates. It is quite within the mark to say that 50% of the children who passed through these schools did not live to benefit from the education which they had received therein. In 1920, the Indian Act was amended to make residential school attendance compulsory. 1927, the Beauval School fire killed 19 students and one staff member. 1933, the Indian Act is amended to appoint all Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers as truant officers. 1937, Indian Affairs issue, issues policy to end the enrollment of Métis children. 1947, Dr. L.B. Pett, Director of the Nutrition Division of National Health and Welfare reports, no school was doing a good job of feeding their students. Like previous generations of residential school children, these children were sent to what were, in most cases, badly constructed, poorly maintained, overcrowded, and unsanitary fire traps. Many children were fed a substandard diet and given a substandard education. In 1943, P.E. Enfield, the principal of Alert Bay BC School, wrote a letter encouraging students not to participate in local potlatches, implying that such ceremonies were based on outdated superstition and led to impoverishment and family neglect. In 1948, there was a special joint committee on the Indian Act that recommended that wherever and whenever possible, Indian children should be educated in association with other children. In 1951, there was an amendment to the Indian Act and agreements with school boards and provincial governments to have First Nations students attend public schools. 1953, the federal government institutes a nationwide policy for discipline at the residential schools. Parents and children developed a variety of strategies to resist residential schooling. Parents might refuse to enroll students, refuse to, to return runaways, or refuse to return students at the end of the summer holidays. Often, however, residential schools were the only available schools. Parents who wished to see their children schooled had few, if any, options. In 1954, the federal government takes over staffing at all residential schools. 50, 1955, the federal government approves extensive program for the construction of schools in the Northwest Territory in Quebec. 1960, food allowances based on Canada's official food rules are introduced in the residential schools. In 1969, the federal government ends a partnership with churches and officially takes over direct administration of the schools. The abuse of children was rampant. From 1958, when it first opened until 1979, there was never a year in which Grower Hall in Inuvik did not employ at least one dormitory supervisor who would later be convicted for sexually abusing students at the school physical abuse and sexual abuse were often intertwined. In 1970, parents occupied Blue Quill School in Alberta for 17 days until the government agreed to transfer control to the Aboriginal Education Authority. The Mohawk School closes with 67 residential schools still remaining operational. 
In 1980, there were still 22 schools remaining operational. In 1982, the Constitution Act recognizes and affirms the rights of Indian, Inuit, and the Métis peoples of Canada. In 1986, the United Church of Canada issues an apology for their role in the residential schools. In 1990, there are still 13 schools in operation. 1991, the missionary oblates of Mary Immaculate apologizes for their role in the residential schools. And in 1993, the Anglican Church of Canada apologizes for their role in residential schools. Children die at the schools from disease, malnourishment and broken hearts. In an effort to bring their own residential schooling to an end, some students attempted to burn their schools down. There were at least 37 such attempts, two of which ended in student and staff deaths. In 1994, the RCMP launches a Native Indian Residential School Task Force to investigate physical and sexual abuse in the BC residential schools. In 1995, the Presbyterian Church of Canada issues an apology in their role. And in 1996, the report of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples calls for a public inquiry into the effects of residential schools. In 1996, the Gordon Residential School in Punichi, Saskatchewan closed. It was the last federally funded residential school in Canada. In 1998, St. Michael's Indian Residential School, the final band run school is closed. Also in 98, former Mohawk Institute students file a class action claim known as the Cloud Case. The United Church of Canada issues an, is an, issues an apology for their role in 1998. In 2000, all residential schools have been closed. In 2005, the Assembly of First Nations Chief Phil Fontaine announces class action lawsuit against the Government of Canada. In 2007, the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement provided benefits to students from 140 schools, yet it omits certain classes and types of schools. In 2008, Prime Minister Stephen Harper apologizes. The treatment of children in residential schools is a sad chapter in our history. Also in 2008, the Indian Residential Schools Truth and Reconciliation, Reconciliation Commission of Canada is established. In 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission releases its first report. In the report, the TRC uses the term cultural genocide to describe the federal government's policies. In, 19, in 2015, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation opens in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Supreme Court Chief Justice, Justice Beverly McLaughlin noted that the most glaring blemish on the Canadian historic records relates to our treatment of the First Nations that lived here at the time colonization. Intergenerational trauma is trauma that is passed on from one generation to another. Often the generation passing the trauma is unable to heal from that trauma due to a lack of resources, supports, or the magnitude of the trauma being too overwhelming. This unresolved trauma may lead to destructive behaviors which be, can become normalized and in turn are passed down to later generations. Most children who lived in these school, schools faced ongoing physical, mental, sexual, emotional, and spiritual abuses during their attendance. Rather than teaching them the ABCs and the one, two, threes, they were taught negative behaviors and coping mechanisms. They were taught that punishment is okay and to be expected. They were taught how to ridicule. They had a skewed sense of sexuality, homophobia, and it was not good to be a First Nations person or to speak traditional languages. Some of the greatest losses, including parenting skills, 
healthy coping mechanisms, cultural practices, native languages, trust, normal childhood, a sense of safety and belonging, a healthy and supportive First Nations communities, a healthy sense of sexuality, and a natural connection to the creator that was not based on fear and damnation. Beyond the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, multiple, multiple lawsuits were launched in the 1990s against the Canadian government by survivors. By October 2001, more than 8,100 lawsuits were launched by survivors. And by 2005, it is estimated the lawsuits surpassed 18,000. In May, on May 10, 2006, the Indian Residential School Settlement led to the formation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And in September 19, 2007, that agreement came into effect. There was a $1.9 billion compensation package, which consisted of common experience payout, 10,000 years, $10,000 for the first year of school and 3,000 for every year after, and included individual assessment program, pro process, compensation for physical and sexual abuse. It provided support for the Aboriginal Health Foundation and support for the residential school commemoration. It also provided the establishment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. The Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement did not, however, cover survivors of day schools. The day school settlement was an agreement made with the federal government in 2019. Total compensation agreed upon was $1.47 billion. The application for claims for day schools closure date was originally set for July 13, 2022. The compensation package was rated on a tiered system of five levels of harms suffered. All claims for levels two to five, the applicants must submit a statement disclosing the abuses that they suffered. Day school claims settlement amounts range from $10,000 to $200,000. The discovery of the unmarked graves. The Truth and Reconciliation Final Report documented 4,100 children who died at residential schools and 3,200 of those that were confirmed deaths. In 2021, the Kamloops Residential School discovered 215 unmarked graves. In 2022, over 1,800 total unmarked graves have been located across Canada. Ground penetrating radar was used at 90, in 1992 at Sacred Heart in the Northwest Territories. And at that time, 300 graves, with approximately 160 of them being children. There now exists a monument at that site. Current search locations include, but are not limited to, Kamloops, Williams Lake, Cranbrook, Cooper Island, St. Joseph's, Battleford, Marital, Muskoweekwen, Brandon, and Shubinaki. Calls to action. Call to action number 71 calls on all vital statistics agencies to make death records available. 72, develop and maintain a national residential school student death registrar. Number 73, to establish and maintain an online registry of residential school cemeteries. 74, to work with churches, and community leaders to inform families of children's burial locations. 75, to call upon all levels of government to develop documentation, maintenance, and protection of residential school burial sites. Commemorative markers to honor the deceased children as well. And number 76, adopt strategies to document, maintain, and protect residential school cemeteries. Number 77, to identify and collect all copies of records relevant to residential schools. And number 78, 
to make a funding contribution of $10 million over seven, over seven years to the TRC. Education by the numbers nationally. In 2006, 67% of all First Nations uh, aged 25 to 64 had completed high school, compared to 87% of non-Indigenous who completed high school. 8% of First Nations had obtained university education compared to 25% of non-Indigenous who have their university education. There was a push out rate as opposed to a dropout rate. Indigenous students are more likely to leave education as it is opposed to fail education if the, in the effect of being pushed out due to circumstances which include social, economic, environmental and political influences. They leave school due to the accumulated effects of their circumstances. There is limited funding for Indigenous education. Currently, the amount is capped at 2% annual increase yearly. For post-secondary funding, this averages out to approximately 10 students that can receive funding for a four-year bachelor's degree. This leaves little funding dollars for new students. Post-secondary education is a treaty right. Indigenous Services Canada provides funding to Inuit and Métis uh, provides funding, but Inuit and Métis students are excluded from this funding. And Inuit and Métis post-secondary education strategies are needed. In 2021, federal government funding amounted to 150.6 million for two years. And for all indigenous students, that only provided for 3,200 indigenous students, 32,000 indigenous students. Funding limitations place barrier on already tough situations in edu accessing education. In Ontario in 2021, 53% of the Indigenous had some post-secondary compared to 65% of non-Indigenous who had some post-secondary. This is people ages 24 to 65 years. Now we move to the West portion of the medicine wheel. This quadrant is represented by the color black, which represents the next phase of life, of blossoming maturity and growing into adulthood. The buffalo sits in the west on the medicine wheel, representing groundedness, solidness, sheer power and abundance, strength, and a deep firm connection to the earth. Sweet grass is placed here as a third sacred medicine, the sacred hair of mother earth. When sweet grass is used in a healing circle, it has a calming effect and is also used for smudging and purification. This section also represents the mental aspect of being, which is why the topics surrounding health and welfare are presented at this point in our discussion. Health and well-being are important topics that must be addressed when teaching and or learning about Indigenous peoples, including housing and living conditions, mental health and suicide rates, the impacts of disease and the lack of potable water. This quadrant also represents the ongoing after effects of residential school in Indigenous society. Health and welfare topics include housing, living conditions, water, disease, suicide and mental health, and access to health care. Calls to action for health and welfare. Number 18 calls upon all levels of government to acknowledge the current state of Aboriginal health as a result of the previous government's policies and to recognize and implement the healthcare rights of Aboriginal peoples. Number 19 is to identify and close the gap in health outcomes between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. 
Number 20 addresses jurisdictional disputes and recognition, respect, and that addresses the distinct health needs of the Métis Inuit and off reserve Aboriginal people. Number 21 provides, wants to provide sustainable funding for healing centers. Number 22 calls upon those who can affect change in the Canadian healthcare system to recognize the importance of Aboriginal healing practices. Call to Action 23 calls upon all levels of government to increase the number of professionals, ensure the retention of workers, and provide culturally competency training for all healthcare professionals. Number 24 calls for medical and nursing students schools to require all students to take a course dealing with Aboriginal health issues. Housing and living on reserve. Provided as partial payment to Indigenous peoples for land that is no longer theirs, living on reserve often means poor living conditions, overcrowding, homelessness, which exists on reserve, and a lack of funding to build, repair, or renovate housing. Issues include lack of plumbing, no electricity, poor insulation, toxic mold, and substandard construction. Negative effects include respiratory problems, asthma, emphysema, the deaths of ba babies previously believed to have been SIDS, high stress, increased sickness, individual violence, and the apprehension of children. Water. Water is one of the, is Canada, is one of the most water rich nations in the world. Yet it is unwilling to guarantee safe access to water for First Nations reserves. Some Indigenous communities are only accessed by plane, which provides logistical challenges to set up water infrastructure. Boil water advisories have been in place for some place in decades in local, some local communities. Issues include E. coli, toxic chemicals, water tainted by parasites and bacteria. Negative effects include skin rashes, sores, skin disease and eczema, gastrointestinal disorders. The federal government bears responsibility for access to clean water. February, 2021, the federal government reported that it had failed to invest sufficient resources, including before the pandemic. Federal monitoring does not include wells, however, and 20% of First Nations homes rely on well water. The federal government does not track waterborne illnesses or potential deaths related to water quality. Access to water is a basic human necessity. Let me just go back. How do I go back? Well, I'll just read this. Um, one example of what reserves in Canada can deal with is seen at Curve Lake First Nations. The water treatment plant was built in, 18, in 1983 and intended to serve a population of 56. However, it only had a shelf life of 20 years, which it quickly outgrew capacity and has not been upgraded. Drinking water advisories and boil water advisories have been in place for a long time. Inspection conducted by the Ontario Ministry found a filter was not removing pathogens and a malfunctioning ultraviolet system. The ministry determined urgent need of a new plant. However, the federal government deemed it low risk as the cost was too high. Designs have been improved for a new plant but construction is currently years away. Disease, suicide, and mental health. Suicide rates are an indicator of health and well-being in Indigenous groups. 
Addictions in Indigenous populations include, but are not limited to, alcohol, which includes, includes binge drinking and long-term alcoholism. Drugs, gambling, and also uh, casinos and bingo. Food issues that cause high cholesterol, obesity, heart problems, and diabetes. Coping mechanisms for poverty, racism, poor social conditions, and underlying emotional issues are at the, how to, how, are at the cause of addictions. Although work is being done in the development of legislation to streamline and provide equitable access to health care for Indigenous peoples, it is important to recognize the impact that decades of poor health care and assimilative policies and practices have had on Indigenous people's health. One of the major health issues impacting Indigenous communities across Canada is mental health. Intergenerational trauma, systemic racism, and poor living conditions can all contribute to poor mental health, with data showing that this impacts youth in particular. Statistics have shown that in looking at the rates of suicide and suicidal ideation among Indigenous people, suicide rates have been the highest among the youth. In fact, one statistic shows that the suicide rate among Indigenous youth, is Indigenous youth, Indigenous youth is five to six times higher than the rate for the general Canadian population. Addictions lead to issues within the justice system. And some of these issues are addressed in the following calls to action. Call to action number 29. Calls to have disputed legal issues determined upon and agreed upon by a set of facts. Number 30, to eliminate the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in custody. And number 31, to provide sufficient and stable funding to provide realistic alternatives to imprisonment. Number 32, to amend the criminal code to allow trial judges to depart from minimum sentencing and restrictions. Addressing these issues related to disease, suicide, and mental health. Offering programs, providing education, addressing underlying issues and behaviors, reviving traditional teachings and practices, banning alcohol and drugs from reserves, implementing drug testing for chief and council, and removing gangs from reserves. TRC call to action 33 recognizes as a high priority the need to address and prevent fetal alcohol spectrum disorder in a culturally appropriate manner. Call to action 34 asks the government to undertake reforms to the criminal justice system to better address the needs of offenders with fetal alcohol syndrome. 35, to eliminate barriers to the creation of healing lodges. And number 36, to provide culturally relevant services to inmates on issues such as addictions, abuse, violence, and sexual abuse. Access to healthcare. Obtaining information on the state of health of Indigenous peoples is difficult. Most data is from the 1990s. Canada does not have a list of well being indicators comparing Indigenous to non Indigenous populations. This lack of data means that these issues receive less public, media, and political attention, and as a result, less funding. First Nations Minister's Accord on Health Renewal in 2003 committed to reducing the health care gap despite this, that gap remains. The federal government has determined funding since 2015 to Aboriginal health, sorry, has terminated funding since 2015 to Aboriginal health organizations and primary health programs. These programs included services that address diabetes, fetal alcohol syndrome spectrum disorder, youth suicide, 
infectious disease, maternal and child health. The federal government insists that providing services to Métis, non-status and urban Aboriginals is a provincial responsibility. Even when healthcare is provided, Indigenous peoples often face discrimination, substandard care, and even abuse within the healthcare system. This is an example of the broad impact social media can have on healthcare issues with Indigenous people. Joyce's Principle. Joyce Eshaquan was an Indigenous woman from the Manawan community and an Antigamek nation. In 2020, Joyce went to hospital in Quebec where she recorded hospital staff making racist and discriminatory remarks towards her and blatantly ignoring her concerns about the medical treatment they were providing to her. Joyce expressed her concerns about receiving morphine as she had underlying conditions and was allergic. The hospital staff ignored her concerns, continually giving her morphine and treating her with cruelty and discrimination. Joyce died in hospital care. The Premier of Quebec condemned the incident as not acceptable. The Prime Minister of Canada described the incident as another example of systemic racism. Following her death, Joyce's principle was proposed by the councils of the Atigamek Nation and Manawan. However, the, Canadian, the Quebec National Assembly refused to adopt this principle as it would require recognition of systemic anti-Indigenous racism within the Quebec healthcare system. Joyce's principle aims to guarantee to all Indigenous people the right of equitable access to health without any discrimination to all social and health services. Joyce's principle requires the recognition and respect of Indigenous peoples traditional and living knowledge in all aspects of health. The Medicine Wheel's fourth quadrant is highlighted as the final segment of the Medicine Wheel is to the North. This quadrant is represented by the color white. It also represents the final stages of life, which also signify knowing and wisdom. The bear is a solitary animal capable of, capable of ferocity, and it signifies the importance of taking command and leading with aloof aggressiveness. It also represents the need for solitary reflection, and it is a symbol to lean on when individual lone courage is required. The mama bear is a protector of her cubs and represents a protection that is needed for the younger generations by the older, wiser Indigenous peoples. Tobacco is the final sacred medicine in this medicine wheel. When we make an offering of tobacco, we communicate our thoughts and feelings through the tobacco as we pray for ourselves, our family, relatives, and for others. When you seek the help or the advice of an elder or a knowledge keeper, you give your offering of tobacco so that they understand that it is a serious request that is made with respect and good intent as tobacco is sacred. This section is represented by the spiritual aspect of being. It is important that these aspects be presented together with elders and wisdom as they all work hand in hand. We learn about the importance of children's services in this final section of the workshop and teaching because of the representation of how young are raised, taught, and protected by the older generations. 
we will examine Jordan's principle and indigenous children in care. Children's services. We will examine the 60 scoop, indigenous children in care, and Jordan's principle in this section. Calls to action number one. Call on all governments to reduce the number of Aboriginal children in care. Number two, prepare and publish annual reports on the number of Aboriginal versus non-Aboriginal children in care. Number four, to establish national standards for child apprehension and custody cases. And number five, to develop culturally appropriate parenting programs for Aboriginal families. The 60s scoop. The Indian Act amendments in 1951 resulted in the closing, eventual closing of the residential schools. The 1951 amendments gave provinces authority to create legislations. Provincial laws continued to separate parents and children through the application of child welfare laws. Child welfare laws removed children from homes and placed them in care through foster homes and adoption outside of their community. During the 1960s, thousands of children were taken into such care. A new generation of children were taken from families and then abused by others. There was no hope given for them to return back to their family or to their community. The term 60 scoop was popularized by Patrick Johnston, the author of the 1983 report, Native Children and the Child Welfare System. A BC social worker coined the phrase when she told him with tears in her eyes that it was common practice in BC in the mid sixties to scoop from their mothers on reserves, almost all newly born children. She was crying because she realized 20 years later, what a mistake it had been. The term refers to a historic period of time and not specific government policy. The overrepresentation of Indigenous children in care accelerated in the 1960s. Indigenous children were apprehended and placed with mostly Euro-Canadian families. Social workers were not required or expected to have training in dealing with Indigenous families. In the 1970s, more than one third of all children in care were Indigenous. 70% 70, 70 of children apprehended were placed in non-Indigenous homes. Indigenous children floated from foster home to foster home. Child, Family, Community and Social Services Act of 1980 required social workers to notify the ban council Council of children being removed. Previously, this was not a requirement. However, there was abuse, physical and sexual abuse within the system. It suppressed the identity and knowing where these children came from. It caused psychological problems. It also called emotional and behavioral issues. Children were played with feelings of not belonging. The roots of problems were sometimes not identified until the children learned of their birth families or heritage sometime much later in life. It created barriers to reaching socioeconomic equity. Indigenous children in care. In the National Household Survey of 2011, 38% of Indigenous children in Canada were found to live in poverty. That compared to 7% of non-Indigenous children who lived in poverty. 
The census of 2016 found that 52.2% of children in foster care are Indigenous. Indigenous children were only 7.7% of the population in Canada. And yet 14,970 out of 28,665 foster children in private homes under the age of 15 were found to be Indigenous. In Alberta, the 2020 and 2021 report established that Indigenous children represent 64 percent of the intervention caseload of social workers. The First Nations Child and Family Caring Society worked to have First Nations children who had been apprehended due to poverty and neglect rather than maltreatment be known. On reserve, First Nations agencies received only 72% of funding levels that their non-First Nations agencies did. The Government of Canada in 2018 conducted a national, regional, regional and community engagement. 65 engagement sessions were held across the country with 2,000 participants. Co-development of legislation that contributes to comprehensive reform of Indigenous child and family services. Indigenous children in care. Aboriginal children and youth in Canada. Canada must do better in 2010, uh, published in 2010. This was a special report submitted to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. The report highlights critical circumstances facing Indigenous children. The Act respecting First Nations, Inuit, Métis children, youth and families of January 1st, 2020. The Act was co-developed with Indigenous provincial and territorial partners. The creation of this Act contributes to the application of UNDRIP. Jordan's principal. Jordan River Anderson, who lived from 1999 to 2004. He was from Norway House Cree Nation, Manitoba. Jordan was born with multiple disabilities and he stayed in hospital right from birth, never returning to his home. When he was two, doctors said that he could move to a special home for his medical needs. However, this little boy was caught in a dispute between federal and provincial governments on who should pay for these services. Jordan passed away at the age of five, still in hospital and never having returned home. Jordan's principle was passed in the House of Commons in 2007. It imposes a legal obligation on both provincial and federal governments with the commitment that First Nations children will get products, services and supports that they need when they need them. Responsibility for these payments will be resolved after the care has been provided. Jordan's principle is a child first principle that aims to eliminate service inequities and delays for First Nations children. Jordan's principle states that any public service ordinarily available to all other children must be made available to First Nations children without delay or denial. But what is covered? Coverage is based upon needs. Each child will be assessed individually. Coverage includes things such as respite care, wheelchair ramps, educational assistance, transportation to school, therapeutic specialists, and healthy aids and health aids. Who is covered? While it applies to all First Nations on or off reserves, this was meant to ensure that there were no gaps in service. Each child needs, each child's needs are evaluated on the basis of substantive equality. The act also ensures that services are provided within 12 to 48 hours after diagnosis.
who can send requests? Parent or a guardian or an authorized representative could. Group requests can also be made from multiple families and guardians. However, there is criticism. Is this good public policy or a narrowing of equity? The federal government would only provide funds for Jordan's principal cases involving children with complex medical needs and multiple service providers. This raises an important question as to how Canada would ensure the provision of necessary and equitable services to children in other Jordan's principal circumstances without providing any funds to do so. Awasak Wiyasin Wiet Wiwet Win. The Cree or the Children's Law. Three First Nations in Alberta opted to take control of child services for their members. Loon Lake River, or so Loon River First Nation, Lubicon Lake Band, and Peerless Trout First Nation. Their aim was to provide better supports better early intervention, and improve dispute resolution, resolution. It gives these reserves complete decision-making power and control over children's services and the supports that they receive. This is a reminder that the medicine wheel is meant to be a healing symbol. These workshops are meant to contribute to reconciliation, which is why the foundation of the workshop is built into the medicine wheel. Building capacity for truth and reconciliation. Some of the ways this can be done and some of the requirements for reconciliation to occur is through the respect and acknowledgement of culture and cultural teachings, tradition, knowledge keepers, elders, including traditional smudge, sweat lodge, land-based learnings, lighting the kulik for the Innu, spiritual ceremonies, sun dance, powwow, round dance, the medicine wheel, canoe journeys, sports, music, literature, art, beating, drumming, teepee building, totem poles, regalia, moccasins, mukbucks, and masks. Modern contemporary, film, documentaries, videographers, print, audio, internet, social media, and APTN, the television station. Calls to action, which would build capacity for truth and reconciliation. Call to action number 79, to develop a reconciliation framework for Canadian heritage and commemoration. Number 80, to establish a national day of truth and reconciliation, which we now know is June 21st each year. Number 81, install a publicly accessible monument in Canada to commemorate residential school survivors and children who were lost. Number 82, to install a publicly accessible monument in each capital city to commemorate residential school survivors and children who were lost. Building capacity for truth and reconciliation. Call to action 13, calls upon the government to acknowledge Aboriginal rights and language rights. Number 14, to enact an Aboriginal Languages Act. Number 15, to appoint an Aboriginal Languages Commissioner to promote and report on adequate federal funding of language initiatives. And number 17, to enable residential school survivors to reclaim their names changed by the residential school system and to waive administration, administration fees to this name chasing, changing process on their identification. 
Ways in which non-Indigenous people can help contribute to reconciliation. Continually learning about Indigenous peoples and history to contribute to holding federal, provincial, and territorial governments accountable for their policy, their action, and their laws. To actively support Indigenous social services organizations. To actively support Indigenous political organizations. To actively support Indigenous singers, songwriters, cultural and language teachers, and artists. To attend Indigenous events and cultural gatherings. Note that powwows are open to all peoples. To stop acts of racism and hatred and call people out. Not to appropriate the culture, traditions, or art, but acknowledge where it comes from and what nation and person it comes from. Advocacy organizations include Idle No More, the Bear Clan Patrol, and Sober Crew, the Native Women Association of Canada, Aboriginal and Native Friendship Centers across Canada, the Métis Nations across Canada, especially the Métis Nation of Alberta, right here where we are, the Congress of Aboriginal Peoples, the Alberta Ministry of Indigenous Relations, the National Centre for Collaboration in Indigenous Education, the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation, INSPIRE, the Orange Shirt Society, Institute for the Advancement of Aboriginal Women located in Edmonton. Days of Remembrance and Recognition. May 5th is the National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls and Two-Spirit People, MMIWG2S. Every day, we are hoping, grieving, loving, and waiting. June is established as a National Indigenous History Month, and June 21st, is a National Indigenous Peoples Day. August 9th is the International Day of World Indigenous Peoples. September 30th is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, also known as Orange Shirt Day. And if you're going to buy orange shirts, go to the Orange Shirt Society or Indigenous um, uh, vendors who sell those shirts. November 8th is the National Aboriginal Veterans Day. November 7th is Inuit Day. And November 16th is Louis Rial Day. On behalf of the Alberta Civil Liberties Research Center and um, to my helpers who made this project possible and work so hard on it. Teresa Miles, Rowan Hickey. Um, special thanks to Linda McKay-Panis and Pamela Doss-Ramos and Sharnjeet who makes all these things happen. I want to say a big thank you and hi hi. Thank you very much. So Thank you so much. I'm almost speechless, which is, as you probably know, would be a shock um, from watching uh, this information and all the work that went into it. I really appreciate it uh, so very much. I wondered if you would have a few minutes to answer any questions that our participants uh, might have, because we have a few moments left. Uh, in the time. I, I would be honored and I welcome any questions. I'll do my best to answer them. And it's the old, and if I don't know, I'll find out. So I'll do the best I can with the tools I have. Um, okay, let me see. There's something in the chat. Oh, 
Oh, no, that's nothing. I, I'll keep my eye on the chat for you, okay? That's yeah, if anybody wants to submit a question or has a comment or concern, just put it into the chat and uh, I've got my chat box open. Also, you can raise your hand too. Yes. If you know how to. <laughs> What I mean by that is which button to push. Yeah, not this. Well, I guess you could I guess, if you're on video. <laughs> um, I just want to share that this was uh, very impactful for me. And it was a year-long process, still in process. I'm going to be holding an all-day workshop on Saturday, February 11th, at Hillhurst United Church at their um, Spirit Living, also known as South Campus address. Um, you can find more information on the Hillhurst United Church website and also on Facebook. And it's open to anybody who wants to attend. We just ask that you register. Awesome. If, you, if you'd like to. That's awesome. I, I also want to thank uh, Miriam Hodgson, who is the evaluator on this program and who has been um, traveling with me as I've made this presentation in various places. I've been to uh, uh, Notre Dame High School. I've been to, um, uh, I, I did a Zoom presentation with the Immigration Education Society. So we're getting our word out there. I see Mary has a question. Your hands up. I think it's May. May, May, <laughs> May has a question. Okay, great. Thank you, Cheryl. A wonderful presentation. I am just from the organization you just mentioned, the Immigrant Education Society. And I seriously, I want to send another invitation for you to join a Canadian Youth Forum on Diversity, Inclusion and Reconciliation. So we are hosting an in-person forum, three-day forum on July 7 to 9 uh, during the first Stampede weekend. So the theme of the whole three-day forum is on reconciliation. So please join us again. And I don't have your your contact so far. Could you please tap in the you know uh, private chat with me or tap in the chatting room so I got you? Or maybe I should ask some colleagues at my actually office. I'll I'm, I'll put my my email address for anybody who wants to get a hold of me, who would like me to do this presentation or the medicine and wheel presentation or do a full day workshop or a partial workshop. My email is. Wonderful, thank you so much. You are most welcome. While you're doing that, I also want to inform everybody that the funding for this project, you might be interested in knowing, uh, in the most part came from the Alberta government anti-racism initiative it was probably the previous government, never mind, the work is getting done. And also some of our work is funded by the Alberta Law Foundation. And I'm sure most of you in attendance today would agree that this is money well spent because there's um, a lot of information to get out there. But what I like too, is there are ideas for ways that we can do something. People feel like, um, wow, this is a huge problem. What can I do as an individual person? And, and so there's ideas there um, for contributions uh, and ways people can make a difference uh, beyond. I mean, the knowledge is very important. And as a person who grew up in, in Alberta, mostly, I can tell you that we never learned any of this material in schools. Um, never, I actually personally never learned anything at all until I was asked to teach about it <laughs> at the university. So we, you know, this is one step is the knowledge. But at the same time, um, we have to go into action, translate the knowledge into, into action, law reform, I can tell you that even Jordan's principle has been the subject of litigation against the Human Rights Commission trying to help out with getting it implemented properly. So um, it's a continuous action that's required. Um, and the reason I know that 
is because um, there are a number of indigenous students in the school. Uh, it's a school for special needs children that my grandson goes to. And um, they're, they are negotiating constantly with the government for funding under Jordan's principle. And it's been taking forever. The school keeps the children, never mind they don't get the funding, but um, it would help tremendously if they, the government would step up on it a little bit and stop with the red tape because um, it's a very beneficial program. Um, my grandson has gotten to know many indigenous children for one thing. And um, I think that's a value in and of itself for, um, you know, settler kids to be more in contact with kids from the Indigenous community. So I thank you so, so very. Um, and yes, thank you, Aruna, for pointing out. I should have mentioned that. Um, so I've, I've participated in, I'm a member of the Law Society of Alberta, and I participated about a year ago in this excellent education project. Um, and uh, there was a small group of ne'er-do-wells, all, all colleagues, call, quote unquote colleagues of mine, who were trying to advocate for the removal of this mandatory education. And um, there was, um, a number of people from the bar and also academics who advocated for um, refusal to remove it. And it was announced yesterday that they were successful. So thank you very much for men mentioning that uh, because um, you can see there are a whole lot of legal uh, aspects to this whole issue, um, historical and current. And so lawyers need to be aware of what's going on, and it should be mandatory. There are a lot of things that should be mandatory, but this one definitely uh, needs to be um, mandatory. And I'm very pleased that most everybody who, who works in the field practices law agreed. Yes, I'm, I was happy to hear that too. <laughs> And I should have said something, but I was so excited. Um, even some of the law students um, were involved in trying to get the professors interested in doing that. So that's super. Thank you. I, I was very happy and, and heartfelt to hear that, that it, that it passed and it was it's still considered uh, mandatory. I'm, I'm pleased. So there's a small movement that, and I like to um, call my presentation Reconcil uh, Truth and Reconciliation Action to focus on action. Because uh, as individuals, as, as organizations, as groups, as families, we can make a difference. And it is about showing up. And I invite um, anybody in the Calgary area who'd like to join us on Valentine's Day, February 14th at the Scarborough United Church at 6 p.m we will be doing a March for Murdered and Missing Women. Cool. And this will be the 15th annual, just to let you know that's something that's coming up and is open to the public. And Sharon Jeet has, um, Sharon Jeet has pointed out that um, this presentation, like all of our presentations, is a, going to be available on our YouTube channel. And uh, there will be a link um, there'll be a link posted on our website to that presentation. And you should also know that there are different presentations prepared for different levels, like um, to be presented in schools, the young people and so on. So they're tailored. Uh, have we answered your question from before May or, or do you have another question? Oh. Oh, I didn't realize. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, anyway, uh, but I also want to invite all of you maybe to join the online 
uh, version, we have an in-person forum three day on July 7 to 9 during the first uh, Calgary Stampede weekend. We also have an online one, which is coming next weekend. Uh, and uh, several University of Calgary students is our host and the EDI office director, Dr. Sivan, uh, is our speaker and panelist. So I really looking forward to seeing you, all of you, and I am sending the information on the chatting room. Check uh, a, a very several, you know, a, a, around a dozen use calling out uh, to Canadian youth and the broad society for diversity, inclusion, and reconciliation. I'm just uh, tapping on the on the chatting room. And thank you for the opportunity for me to. Just to, to send you the information. Thank you. Thank you so much, May. And there's a question about the presentation. And yes, um, everything we do is posted on our website. Um, you have free access. Um, it won't just be, of course, the participants. It'll be anyone who visits our website. Um, and yes, you. one thing you will be receiving within a few days um a uh, survey and it would be very helpful to us if you would uh, complete the survey it helps us with our funders so they know that we're asking um and it looks like uh, may's posted the links to some of the activities she's been pre presenting and so the answer william is yes uh, we do we do post it and it's available to anyone uh, on our website and um, you can also join our um, oh our website's easy it's aclrc.com and uh, I'll post it as well thank you thank you Linda you're most thank welcome you, we're always working on it um, oops return button Wait a minute. To everyone. There. Oops. My spell check just changed it to acorn. <laughs> Tammy, me. Tammy, send it out to everybody. Thank you, Tammy. I'm so slow. <laughs> no, nope, still says <laughs> <It's> acorn. acorn. <laughs> oh. It's not, that's not what I typed. I promise you, just go with Emmy. <laughs> so it looks like our time is almost all over. I I can't begin to thank you enough for all the hard work you and your team have, have done on this um, and continue to do on it. It's very valuable work. And thank you for today's presentation. Uh, very thorough. I can see how people, it's heavy, and people will need to sit and digest some of this now uh, afterwards. And, and, uh, but, you know, focus on the action part, <laughs> not the guilt part. <laughs> so. Thank you so much. It has been truly been an honor and very humbling. And I'm very grateful. Oh, well, thank you, and thank you all to share. for at your attendance today and support of the work of the research center. Thank you to all of everybody who came and uh, and took in this session. I'm very grateful, and it's thank it's you. Good thing. We we change minds one one mind at a time. Good. Thank you I so guess, much. I guess I'll end it now. I'm not good at saying goodbye. <laughs> Thank you so much, Linda. I'm very I grateful. And then thanks to each and every one of you for being here, participating mm -hmm. today, just by being here and your presence. And uh, I wish you continued uh, learning as, as long as we're breathing, we're learning. So don't forget that. <laughs> so, so keep on breathing, keep on learning. <laughs> it's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.